Number 10, Jean Grey was resting the whole time. After Jean Grey died as part of the Phoenix Saga, everyone was left flabbergasted. During the story, we'd seen Jean merge with the Phoenix Force, become insanely powerful, lose control over this power, become corrupted and dark, basically become a huge supervillain, and finally sacrifice herself, knowing that if she didn't, it would only end badly. Or worse than badly, because it was already pretty bad. Jean Grey, one of the original X-Men team, was dead or so it seemed. Later on, Marvel would want to revive the original X-Men team and bring them together on a new team and comic series called X-Factor. So, Jean needed to come back to life. But, hey, she was dead. So, we got the added story to explain that the version of Jean that had died wasn't really her, but was a separate entity known as Phoenix. Sort of this merged thing, wasn't really Jean. Jean herself was resting comfortably in a pod beneath the ocean, still lived, and would be able to return. Yay. Number 9. Tony Stark was adopted. Yep, that's a thing that happened. I'm just wondering if this one will show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I can't deny that if we get an Arno as a result, an Arno Stark, I would actually not be too upset with that. <laughs> Even though this retcon's pretty weird. The reason this retcon was such a terrible retcon for Tony was that his parents and their loss always remained a great catalyst and huge emotional plot point for him. Now, of course, just because he was adopted doesn't mean that he can't still love his parents as much as he did and still be as emotionally affected by their death. That's not what I'm saying. But his parents also had a naturally born son that they hid from Tony, who was born before they adopted Tony, and he also didn't know that he was even adopted. Also, there were aliens and alien tech involved in Arno's birth, which explains why this all had to be a secret, but also just, it's just a lot. All in all, this revelation greatly changed the way Tony saw his parents and made their relationship more complex. And I don't know if either of those things needed to happen. Number 8. Hail Hydra One of the most shocking moments in Marvel's comic history was when it was revealed that Captain America was actually a sleeper agent for Hydra the whole time. Say what? The guy who for years was diametrically opposed to Hydra and all their beliefs, who had tried and succeeded to foil their plots countless times, was a Hydra agent? How could this be? Well, apparently all those wins were a part of his doing a very good job to convince us all and trust him so that he could stab us in the back at the right moment and take over America, becoming Hydra Supreme. Fortunately, this evil version of Captain America would later be revealed to have been created by Kobik, a living sentient version of the Cosmic Cube who was manipulated into making this retcon happen. What's more, the true Captain America still existed within the shards of the Cosmic Cube and would return once more to defeat his evil self, fixing the timeline. So I mean, at least this retcon ended up not staying permanent, but still, it's pretty weird. Number 7. Killed his mother. He just likes to kill everyone in his family, pretty much. Granted, his mother did try to kill him when he was born, so this feels almost somewhat poetic. In the series Thanos Rising, we saw more into Thanos' origins and backstory as a youngster. Here we see him become more and more obsessed with death, specifically Lady Death, starting out with a weak stomach but growing to enjoy murdering animals, other children his age, and eventually killing his own mother, searching for something that would help him find who he was. Oddly enough, he thought killing his mother, Suisan, would make him somehow feel like or become less of a monster monster? As she had threatened him with a scalpel when he was just a baby, driven mad by his appearance, he also attacked her with one, tying her up and gagging her before cutting her open. Also, what's with that sexy position that she's in when all of that's happening? That's weird. Number 6. Ugly equals evil. That's what Thanos' retcon taught us. Yep. Thanos' backstory was added in detail in the series Thanos Rising, and what many fans were surprised to learn was that his mother was apparently driven mad by her newborn baby's hideous appearance, and because of his appearance, claimed that she needed to kill him. That's pretty terrible. She sensed basically that because he was ugly, he would also be supremely evil. And the really shocking part of this was, of course, that she was right. But also, what the heck? Just because you don't like the look of your baby doesn't mean it should deserve to die. Fortunately, a retcon was later added to fix this when it was changed to it not being the baby's appearance, but to a specific deviant gene in the child's genetic code that concerned both of his parents instead. Still, not great just analyzing your baby's genes and being like, we already know you're going to be evil. But it's better than it just being about the ugliness in appearance as a pure reason for condemnation, I guess. 
Number 5. Spider-Man's Non-Sister So this is kind of another retcon that for me is similar to Nadia's. I like the idea of this character, but the whole story involving her is... Well, it's pretty wacky. Teresa showed up in Amazing Spider-Man Family Business claiming to be Teresa Parker, Peter's sister. She believed she was the daughter of Richard and Mary Parker, Peter's parents, and we got a few cool adventures with her assuming this belief to be true. She was retconned into existence, but honestly, I thought she was kind of a cool retcon to add in, so I was cool with that. However, things got weirder when we learned that the secret sister we'd never heard of till now was all a lie, and that Teresa actually wasn't who she said she was, despite what she herself had been manipulated to believe. It was all a trick and Mentalo had manipulated Teresa into believing it herself. It was all part of Kingpin's plan to basically lure Peter to a tomb. And we don't actually even know who Teresa's parents are now. Still a mystery. They even manipulated how Peter saw Teresa, making her appear more like him. So she'd look more like his sister? <sighs> it's weird. I wish she was actually his sister. That would have been cooler, I think. Number 4. Peter and MJ's marriage never happened During the story One More Day, Peter made a pact with Mephisto to ensure that his Aunt May would live. Part of this deal was also that people would forget Peter's secret identity, which was currently out in the open. Although it wasn't like a bargain part of the deal, it was just a thing that would happen. But what did Mephisto want in return for this? Peter to never be a hero again? Did he want his soul? No. No, 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 no. He wanted his marriage? Mephisto wanted to take Peter's marriage to MJ. And by that, I don't mean that he wanted himself to marry MJ, which would actually make, in a weird turn of events, more sense. I mean, he wanted to make it so that their marriage never existed. This was such a strange request that many were left speechless when Peter agreed, and this actually happened. What was likely really going on is that Marvel no longer wanted Peter to be married. Or Joe Caseta never, never wanted Peter to get married in the first place. They wanted to return to the days when Peter was flying free and single, so this story happened to erase it. Number 3 brought peace to the world. If you don't know Cosmic Ghost Rider, here's the abbreviated version of his backstory. He's basically a superpowered Frank Castle from an alternate world where Thanos killed everyone. He is the power cosmic and is also a spirit of vengeance and a ghost rider, likely the last one. He's also been around so long and alone for so long that he's pretty mentally unstable. He was one of the last to stand against Thanos, but eventually ended up joining him because there wasn't really anyone else left to fight alongside, and he realized he couldn't beat Thanos at the end of the day. Cosmic Ghost Rider first appeared in 2016's Thanos series and would get a few miniseries of his own thereafter. His self-titled series shows him stealing baby Thanos so that he might raise him to be better, thereby preventing all the death and destruction we've come to know Thanos for. But even with Cosmic Ghost Rider's insane but well-meaning influence, we learn Thanos cannot be fixed. At first, CGR thinks he succeeded, but he later learns when he runs into Thanos from the future that his Punisher Thanos of a son has somehow grown up to be an even worse tyrant than without his influence, proving that even when people try to raise Thanos right and try to prevent him from becoming some crazy tyrant, it will still always end badly. Thanos forcefully brought peace to the world and when others resisted his rule, he killed those who opposed him and created internment camps to keep the rebels in. Number 2. Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver Were Never Mutants If you have been subscribers to our channel for a while, then you likely saw this one coming from a mile away. A list of the worst retcons with Amanda hosting it? Hmm, I wonder what she's gonna rank high up on that list. And you were right. One of the worst retcons in mutant history for me will always be this. During the events of Axis, it was revealed that Wanda Maximoff and her brother Pyotr, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver respectively, were never the children of Magneto. And as such, never mutants. Instead, we learned that the High Evolutionary abducted them when they were young, experimented on them, and then disguised them as mutants and returned them back to the world. Why? Well, we don't really know. Which is part of the reason this is such a terrible retcon. That and it erased years of meaningful family drama and history, and created a bunch of plot points that no longer really made any sense. Number 1. Snap Wilson Even worse than my own personal nerd rage towards the retcon of the Maximoff twins, everyone's outrage, my own included, against this retcon. I still can't believe this was a thing that even happened in the comics. Oh my goodness. Sam Wilson in the comics became a good friend of Captain America and was even known as his ally, the superhero Falcon. However, it was revealed that Sam Wilson wasn't actually Sam Wilson, a social worker from New York with falconry skills. This was all a fabrication of the Red Skull. who 
had used the cosmic cube to turn him into the perfect partner for Captain America as part of an insidious plot. The true persona of Wilson was the criminal thug and pimp known as Snap Wilson. What? This would be revealed to Cap as being his true persona, which Cap would then save him from. Yikes. Fortunately, years later, we would see a retcon that would basically undo this one, turning the fake persona of Sam Wilson into the real persona for him, and the originally retconned real persona of Snap Wilson into the fake. Meaning that Sam Wilson was always Sam Wilson, and Snap Wilson was the version created and used by Red Skull. Whew, thank goodness. Number 10, Hank Pym's secret daughter. Nadia Van Dyne is Hank's daughter who we didn't know existed until 2016. She was introduced in a free comic book day issue about Civil War II. Now of course I like Nadia Van Dyne as a character, don't get me wrong, but her being added in retroactively as Hank's lost daughter was something that I felt like was a bit much. When we learned of Nadia's backstory, we learned that she was the daughter of Hank Pym and his first wife, Maria Travoya. Maria was kidnapped during her and Hank's honeymoon and killed. Nadia ended up being raised in Russia, trained in the Red Room. Eventually she escaped after learning of who her parents really were. By the time she got back to America though to see her father, Nadia learned of his sacrifice to save the world from Ultron and his death as a result. She decided to seek out her stepmother Janet Van Dyne and became close enough to her that she felt compelled to change her own last name to Van Dyne. Cause that's not confusing at all. She's Hank's daughter, she's not at all related to Janet and yet she has her last name. Number 9 Falcon's X Gene. Remember that time Falcon was revealed to be a mutant and then we explained that origin away with, you know, a faulty sentinel? If you don't, let me explain. In issue 174 of Captain America, we see Professor X meeting Falcon and Cap. Charles implied Falcon's connection to his bird seemed telepathic, and that Falcon's telepathic abilities may be mutant in origin. Falcon himself took this suggestion to heart and even considered what it might mean for him to be a mutant, pondering on his strong, seemingly psychic link to his bird Red Wing. He then encountered a sentinel who identified him as a mutant, and so he was a mutant for a time. This was established. And this wouldn't really be revisited or retouched till 2001 where the idea of Falcon being a mutant was tossed in the trash and explained away as a sentinel simply malfunctioning. Wah, wah, wah. Number 8. Black Widow's Confusing Backstory Natasha being a mysterious spy from Russia who switched sides means that yes, we are going to get a complex backstory for her. But it actually wasn't always that complex. Natasha was inspired to fight for her nation originally when her husband was assumed dead in combat. Her husband wasn't really dead of course and it was implied that this was all part of a plot to basically encourage her to fight for her country. Before that, Natasha was a renowned ballerina. Later on however, this whole origin was revealed to be a lie when we learned that the Red Room had embedded memories of her being a ballerina in her mind. They made her think she had trained in ballet, but she hadn't really, because I guess that's what the Red Room does, they mess with you and give you fake memories. Her story was also changed from a woman who was inspired by her husband's sacrifice to put her own life on the line for her country as well, to that of a woman being blackmailed and threatened into becoming a spy in order to protect her husband. Number 7, Zorn. Okay, so I was actually going to make the title of this point a little more explanatory, but then I realized how long that would actually make the title of this point. Okay, so Zorn was basically a character who showed up in the comics who was a mutant who always needed to wear a mask. Because of this, we never saw Zorn's face, leading many to wonder who was really under the mask. Although I think most people just thought, well, it's probably a new mutant because, you know, we get new mutants added to the comics every day. But no, of course, this is comics, so it had to be something. One. In a dramatic twist, it was Magneto. But no, of course, this is comics, so it had to be someone that we already knew. In a dramatic twist, it was revealed to be Magneto, who had infiltrated Xavier's school in order to rally up mutant support and help him create an army. He then destroyed New York, shot Emma Frost, killed Jean, and was eventually killed by Wolverine. Later on, however, Magneto would turn up again because, well, he's Magneto, and writers wanted to inch him closer to that line between villain and anti-hero again, so they basically retconned Magneto's involvement in all of this. It turns out there was a real Zorn and it was actually Zorn's brother impersonating Zorn impersonating Magneto who was really to blame. Wow. Just wow. Number 6. Thanos. Number 1 dad? 
Thanos has never really been known as a caring and kind person. Even the people he keeps close to him are never really fully safe from his wrath. Faithful servants, family members, to Thanos, everyone is pretty much disposable. The same could be said for his adopted daughter Gamora, who he hardened and transformed into a killer until she ended up later rebelling. In the 2019 Thanos series, however, we learn how Gamora's relationship with her father was, well, more complex. How he actually, in his own way, was kind of a good father to her. This series also highlights how much they both cared for each other, despite the fact that an Infinity Gauntlet, which happened in the 90s, pre this series, but in terms of continuity, would have taken place after this, Thanos seems to not show any regard for his adopted daughter's life. So, it's kind of a retcon. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Number 5. Influences Thane this doesn't sound so bad as a title for a point, until you realize just what that influence did. Thane was Thanos' son, whose mother had been an inhuman. Before Thanos showed up, Thane was a healer and didn't know that he was Thanos' son. Thanos, in his hunt to eliminate the child, demanded the heads of Attilans and therefore the Inhumans' children. This ended with a fight where Thanos fought Black Bolt and Black Bolt detonated a Terrigen bomb. The bomb was so massive it triggered Terrigenesis in all those who had an Inhuman lineage on the planet Earth's surface, including, you guessed it, Thane. Thane's power was death and he instantly went from trying to save people so basically killing everyone around him in an instant. Pardon my snapping. Completely unaware of what was happening. He later learned of his legacy and Thanos promised he would kill him. However, Ebony Maw betrayed his master and instead set Thane free and influenced him to accept his destiny and fight his father. Thane did this and won, trapping Thanos. Learning of his heritage and with the influence of the evil Ebony Maw, who was only there due to the fact that he was originally a member of Thanos' Black Order and was originally loyal to him. Thane became a deadly and dangerous villain over time, with power initially rivaling his father's. Number 4. Spider Destiny Now you know me, I love the Spider-Verse, I love spider totems, but not all fans share my bizarre obsession with the Spider-Verse and spider Geddon stories and the villains known as the Inheritors. I swear, I'm like the only person that really loves the Inheritors. If you also love them, let me know in the comments. Show yourselves. With these stories came a pretty huge retcon, which basically implied via learning about the Great Web and the spider totems placed within it, that every spider, man, or person had a kind of destiny to become that spider person. In other words, Peter Parker didn't have a freak accident, he was actually destined to become Spider-Man. It was fate! Many fans were not a fan of this change to his origins, as they felt it detracted from what makes Peter Parker so appealing. That he's just an average kid who got a freak spider bite that gave him powers, as opposed to it being all ordained. Number 3. Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy's Relationship This little frightening retcon was added during the Sin's Past story. It also made Peter look like an insensitive jerk, just for good measure as well. The story here that was added in was that Gwen Stacy had an affair with Norman Osborn, a man who was much older than her at the time and who would go on to be responsible for her death. This affair resulted in Gwen becoming pregnant with twins, which she secretly gave birth to. Norman then raised these children, lying to them that they were actually the children of Spider-Man and Gwen and that Spider-Man had killed their mother, turning them into misguided villains. This was not a retcon anyone needed, but hey, it was one that we got. Number 2. Aunt May's Death Remember when Aunt May died, but it wasn't really Aunt May, but an actress who had actually died while impersonating Aunt May? Yeah. That was a weird villainous plot. What we saw in the comics as an elderly Aunt May's death was later retconned into being one of the weirdest and most elaborate plots of Green Goblin's criminal career. It was later revealed that the woman who was dead and buried and who we thought had been Aunt May was actually an elderly actress who happened to be on her deathbed and who had agreed to take on one last role in order to torment Spider-Man? Prove how great of an actress she was? Her motives are pretty foggy. Maybe Green Goblin agreed to pay any surviving relatives of hers a ton of cash? I, I honestly don't know. What had really happened was this actress had been genetically altered to exactly match Aunt May's genes, meaning no one at the hospital suspected this imposter to be a fake. She died after revealing to Peter that she knew he was Spider-Man and was even buried in Aunt May's intended plot next to Uncle Ben for a time. That is, of course, until we all learned that Aunt May was really still alive and this had been some kind of bizarre ruse. 
Number 1. Clone Saga I won't deny that in my time on this channel I've come to actually somewhat love elements of the Clone Saga. I originally disliked Clone Saga when I started working here, but I very much have come to appreciate parts of the story and to acknowledge that without Clone Saga, you know, we wouldn't have some very awesome characters like Ben Riley and Kane Parker. However, one thing I still cannot get over is how long Marvel spent tricking everyone with this story. People spent 20 years thereabouts thinking they were reading Spider Man, as in Peter Parker, only to find out that all those stories were not his but actually belonged to a clone. Granted, at least it was a pretty cool clone who we'd all come to love after. But at the time, this was a pretty shocking and frustrating revelation after years of stories, and it left a lot of fans feeling betrayed at the time. Number 10, rendered. Eros powerless. It's got to be hard being the brother to Thanos. Just ask Eros, aka Star Fox, about it, and I'm sure he'll tell you as much. Star Fox is often presented as being a hero in the comics, and yet, despite his own reputation trying to do good at least, he has to live in Thanos' shadow. Of course, Eros has done some questionable things in the past as well, but I still can't help but feel a little bad for him. During the 1991 Infinity Gauntlet miniseries, while Thanos threatens Marvel's greatest heroes, Star Fox is taken prisoner by his brother who basically rendered him powerless and makes him watch as he torments his fellow superhero colleagues and friends, eventually killing many of them. Though of course, they would return. That is what it's like to be the brother to the Mad Titan though. He takes the phrase of sibling rivalry to a whole new level. Number 9. Kills his own servants Thanos is not even above killing those who serve him. He has obviously without much remorse killed his own adopted daughter Gamora before in the comics and in the Marvel Cinematic Universe although it pained him, he also chose to sacrifice Gamora to get his way and complete his plan. The Black Order however are not usually people who betray Thanos, unlike his traitorous daughter. They are usually loyal to a fault, having been tested over the years by Thanos and chosen for their strength, ingenuity and ruthlessness. However, sometimes their own greed for power gets the best of them. Such was the case when Corvius Glaive ruled the Black Quadrant in Thanos' stead and was made to end his own life upon Thanos' return for basically doing so. He was like, I was just keeping the seat warm and Thanos was like, nah nah. I don't believe you, you're dead. Before there was the Black Order, by the way, there was the Butcher Squadron as well, a team which Thanos assembled but would actually choose to murder members of at random for his own reasons. Not really a guy you want to serve, I don't think. Number 8. Killed his father Mentor is known in the comics as Thanos' father. Alars, aka Mentor, has felt deep and intense guilt for years over his son's actions. At times, Mentor has even tried to intervene to try and fix the disaster and bloodshed that Thanos has wrought. In the end, Thanos grew sick and was dying from an unknown and seemingly uncurable disease. He turned to his brilliant father, an accomplished scientist, for a cure, after exhausting every other option he could think of. Mentor was forced to help Thanos when he threatened the other scientists lives and the lives of their families who resided on the moon where Alars was living. When pressed however, Mentor shared that a cure would take years to find if there even was one and that he was happy Thanos was finally dying. He only regretted not killing his son himself years ago. This outburst resulted in Thanos having an outburst of his own and he murdered his father in response. It's not a great relationship. Number 7. Professor X Married Mystique Some retcons that are really strange come from film inspiration. As a lot of people discussed in the comments, many feel that Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver for example would still be mutants today if it wasn't for their being introduced in the MCU's Avengers franchise, which didn't have the rights to include mutants, so we had to kind of unmutant them. I feel as though the case was possibly similar for this weird secret retcon. In 2013's Uncanny X-Men issue 24, we learned of Mystique and Charles Xavier's secret marriage, meaning that the child we saw Mystique gave birth to while in the guise of Moira McTaggart was likely one willfully conceived as opposed to Mystique tricking Charles into sleeping with her, which would have been super weird and pretty pretty not good in my opinion. In the X-Men prequel films such as First Class which came out in 2011, we see a different kind of relationship between Raven and Charles. We get this weird love triangle between Charles, Raven and Eric. And it seems more of that likely influenced this weird retcon plot point revealed in the comics in Charles's will. Number 6, Child Killer. 
You wouldn't think that Thanos would make a great father, and he doesn't really. <laughs> but that hasn't stopped him from siring many children throughout the galaxy and adopting others at times. Gamora is his adoptive daughter, but he also has a naturally born son named Thane. In fact, Thanos even attempted to find his son at one point during Infinity. He didn't want to find him to reconnect though, or repair a lost or severed connection. He wanted to find his son in order to kill him. Not knowing where to look, he decided the best course of action was to kill as many children within Thane's possible age group as possible. Thanos disguised this plot as one of conquest, ordering planets to pledge fealty to him and offer a tribute of the heads of their youths between the ages of 16 to 22. Number 5. Doom is never wrong Some people like Doctor Doom a little too much. I'm probably guilty as being one of those people. To the point that they can't let him be flawed. Doom must be perfect. Well, while Doom may believe that, the reality is it's his flaws that actually help to make him such a great character, and also are important because they are a part of the reason for his villainous nature. Originally, his vendetta started against the Fantastic Four, and more specifically, Reed Richards, years ago, when Reed tried to give him pointers on a device he was building. Reed warned Doom that it was unstable, but Doom didn't listen. The device ended up exploding because, well, Richards had been right, scarring Doom's face. Unable to blame himself due to his huge ego, Doom decided to blame Reed, and thus a villain was born. However, retcons have come into play a few times in regards to his origins as to whose fault the device exploding really was. In one retcon, it's actually implied that it's Mephisto's fault, but if that's true, then why has Doom hated Reed so much for pretty much forever? Another retcon implied that Ben Grimm possibly intentionally sabotaged Doom's machine, which is an even worse retcon retcon because it makes Grimm, normally a very lovable character, look like a jerk. Both of these retcons help to buff out Doom's flaws at the expense of making his feuds illogical. Number 4. Mass Extermination Policy We all know Thanos as someone who is heartless, ruthless, and who kills to get closer to his one true love, Lady Death. And yet there is another reason he sometimes is known as a mass exterminator when it comes to various species and alien worlds. In the 2019 Thanos series, we see him going up against one of his greatest foes, Magus. And we see how he attempts to prevent Magus from expanding his universal Church of Truth, a much more evil religion than it sounds, let me tell you. By killing Killing everyone in order to prevent Magus from ever being able to convert them. You can't convert people if they're dead. Well, really joining Magus' church also is not an ideal scenario anyways. Killing them to prevent this is intense and cruel. In truth, Thanos has always enjoyed killing, so to him it's likely like hitting three birds with one stone. He not only gets to rob Magus of converts, but also gets to revel in death, and also gets closer to Lady Death through killing. Yay! Number 3. Kang Sometimes we talk about retcons that are ridiculous because they hurt the overall story. Other times there are retcons that feel like they don't really need to happen, and then there are those that just cause more confusion than really necessary. That's sort of the case with Kang. Kang the Conqueror was a villain who was first introduced in Avengers issue 8 in 1964. He is known for being a time traveling villain who enjoys sitting and floating around while menacing other people. As time went on, however, we'd come to discover due to the fact that he's a time traveler, the Kang was actually a bunch of other people, including Immortus and even Iron Lad. While these retcons were sometimes interesting, they don't really add much to his story, and at this point Kang being revealed as just about anyone is so old hat, it's kind of lost its shock value as well. Now we're going to get him in the MCU, I don't know what that's going to be like. Could be weird, could be great. Number 2. Sacrifices millions for the love of a lady In the comics, Thanos merely wielded the Infinity Gauntlet and snapped those out of existence to simply get closer to Lady Death, who he was wooing. That's right, in the comics the snap was simply an attempt to impress his eternal crush. Killing billions just for a chance at love with someone? A chance? That's pretty terrible if you ask me. Number 1. Killed Death if this feels like a paradox, well, it kind of is. But we need to remember, in the Marvel Universe, for Thanos anyways, death is not just a concept, but is also a person. Lady Death, his love. In an alternate universe, however, Death and Thanos have a different relationship. Less of an unrequited love story, as Death is posing as Thanos' mother. Until Thanos realizes that Death actually has been lying to him, and takes revenge on her by killing her. This doesn't sound so terrible, until you realize the ramification of this action, 
as Thanos does in the story. Basically, killing death messes with the whole balance of the universe and everything, which as we've seen in other alternate worlds like the Cancerverse, can be very, very bad. Of course, this doesn't go as terribly as the Cancerverse, as this happens in Earth X, an alternate world known as Earth 9997, and we at least don't have the influence of the many angled ones in this alternate world to worry about. Number 10, Childhood Trauma. You might think Peter has some pretty intense childhood trauma himself, and he does, but he's not alone here. MJ also had a rough childhood. She grew up in a home where her family was constantly forced to move because her dad, a professor, always felt the need to take on new jobs and move to new schools. Maybe because he had had an anger problem or, as MJ speculated, because he was looking for some kind of satisfaction that he never really could find. This made it hard for MJ to make new friends, but she forced herself to be even more outgoing and charismatic, entertaining her classmates and making everyone fall in love with her. That classic MJ charm. However, what her friends didn't know was at home she and her sister Gail and her mom were suffering. Her father mistreated them and even at one point attacked Gail in front of Mary Jane. Eventually, her mother left her father, but I don't think MJ ever really healed from her trauma, instead choosing to use her love of performing as a creative outlet and a means of escape. Number 9. Losing Her Mom Not only did Mary Jane have a difficult life growing up, but she also lost her mother at a young age, after her father had disappeared from her life, and right around the time her sister had her husband walk out on her, while she was pregnant with their last child. Oh my goodness. The death of her mom took a toll on MJ and served as a wake up call. Feeling her mother and her sister had both wasted their lives, giving up on their passions to become mothers, she left her sister, moving in with her aunt Anna in Brooklyn, and decided to pursue her own dreams of becoming a professional actress. And before we move on to our next spot, just a quick little reminder to give that like a little click. It really helps us out on the channel, and thank you so much if you've already done so. Number 8. Killed by Love This one only ranks lower because it is technically from an alternate future but it's still pretty terrible. In Spider-Man Reign, Mary Jane dies young after getting cancer, which despite it also being implied with her mom to run in her family in terms of her medical history, it is in this case caused by her closeness to Peter Parker himself and all his radioactive fluids. In the end, Peter's radioactivity is the one to blame for Mary Jane's death and she lives on in his memories, haunting him. We also need to acknowledge how unkind, senile old Peter is to ghost memory MJ, because that is also very much a thing in Spider-Man Reign. In typical Peter fashion, he seems to almost take out his own feelings of guilt on her ghost, having more than a few outbursts that are directed at MJ's non-existent self. Number 7. Suffered Peter Parker's Hostility there are multiple times that Mary Jane has suffered being emotionally mistreated by Peter, but this moment in retrospect for me is one of the worst. Just after Gwen died, Peter was caught tearfully mourning her by MJ who had been waiting in Harry and Pete's apartment. She was in a lot of pain at the time having just heard of Gwen's death and mourning her basically best friend Gwen herself. Peter however did not want to hear it and insisted his pain was actually greater than hers and that she couldn't possibly understand how hurt he was. Wow, what a cruel and immature way to respond. Like, I know Peter was hurting, but ouch. MJ did not deserve this. He also goes on to say, don't make me laugh Mary Jane, you wouldn't be sorry if your own mother died. Whew. This stings quite a bit given what we now know of MJ's past, that Mary Jane's mother did die, and that it was extremely painful for her. Granted, Peter might not have known this yet, in fact I'm pretty sure he didn't in terms of continuity, but still. Ouch! I'm sure when he found out about that later, he like thought back to those words and was like, oh, I was pretty terrible. That was bad. I hope he apologized to her later. Number 6. Fan Hate The fan hate that we see by some is actually seen as being created somewhat by Marvel's hate for her character depending on who we talk to. So what's really going on here? Why do people hate MJ? Well, there are Spider-Man fans who blame Mary Jane almost exclusively for Gwen's death. Not like a conspiracy theory like, you know, Mary Jane was secretly the Green Goblin or anything weird like that. It's more just that MJ basically caused Gwen to be killed because writers wanted MJ and Peter to be together. And many fans actually would have rather that he stayed with Gwen, who they think is a more suitable fit. So the way they see it, if MJ wasn't around, Gwen would still be around today. Then there are those who criticize her fancy free lifestyle and just how she's kind of all about having fun. 
People didn't think that she was serious enough. Though really with the context of her history, it's kind of hard to see how people felt this was like a problem. Like that's kind of just part of Mary Jane's characterization and it makes sense if you know her history. Then there are those who feel she simply isn't well enough written, that she's basically an underdeveloped character without really much depth. Regardless, there is a lot of hate that gets thrown MJ's way that I think in most cases is very undeserved. Let me know what you folks think of this hate in the comments. Number 5. Had her marriage retconned While this is pretty bad, her relationship with Peter Parker hasn't been all that great, which is why I'm ranking this one so low. Given all that MJ has gone through during her marriage, it might be better honestly if it never happened. Although I'm sure Mary Jane's love of Peter would prevent her from ever agreeing with me. Because yeah, that love is pretty strong, Tiger. Mary Jane and Peter's marriage was the price that Spider-Man was asked to pay Mephisto in exchange for his help in saving Aunt May's life. Rather than let his elderly Aunt May pass away, Peter agreed. Which is pretty crazy considering, you know, Aunt May's really old, so like, you could've just maybe let her go, but I guess not. And if you're wondering why he didn't ask other people for help here, who you know are superheroes, magic users, scientists, and slash or doctors, there's some people I'm sure that are all of those things, he actually did ask them for help. And apparently, no one else could help him. This was a truly terrible comics moment, but it happened and it resulted in Peter's and Mary Jane's lives forever being changed. Number 4. Thought dead, then kidnapped Mary Jane was on a flight to a shoot when the plane exploded and she was presumed dead. For over a year in comics, MJ was simply a ghost, haunting Peter, who truly believed that she was actually gone. In reality, Mary Jane had been kidnapped by a mutant stalker who was obsessed with her and with becoming Spider-Man himself, known only as Stalker. It was revealed that this villain was a mutant who planned to use their telepathic powers to, in essence, become Peter and take over his life. Mary Jane was kept locked away and kidnapped by this villain for months before Spider-Man finally came to rescue her. In the end, she and Peter got away after she managed to knock out her captor using a chair to basically hit Spidey, which because Stalker was psychically linked to him, hurt him more than it did Peter, who obviously is much more resilient, I'm sure, than Stalker. The whole thing, I feel like, should have really taken more of a toll on just about everyone involved, but hey, comics, so I feel like we never really talk about it again. Number 3. Terrorized by Venom One of the moments that caused a lot of grief and trauma for MJ took place when she was completely terrified by Venom's appearance and presence. Not only was MJ left almost broken by the experience, almost perpetually and severely afraid of the villain, but this wouldn't be the last that she'd see of Venom either. Venom has not only terrified MJ in the main continuity, but he has also done so in alternate universes too, where he has targeted both her and other members of Peter's and generally also MJ. MJ's family together. Due to her intensely negative relationship with the symbiote, fans even were initially triggered at the sight of the black suit when we were given a variant cover featuring MJ bonded with the symbiote in place of Eddie Brock. This was intended to celebrate MJ, but it definitely stirred up some uh, mixed feelings for many of her fans. Although it is a cool variant, it does look cool, I will say. Number 10, one less eye. That's right, kicking off the list at number 10, we have a Spider Man moment that gives me Goosebumps every time I see it. We start now with Spider-Man The Other, Evolve or Die, where we see Spider-Man get his eye ripped out. Yeah, Moreland put Spider-Man through quite the battle, but ultimately it ended with his eye being a midnight snack. Spider-Man even compared being hit by Moreland to being hit by the Incredible Hulk, saying how he's never been hit so hard in his life. Ah, he has no idea it's about to get so much worse. And before we continue, if you guys haven't done so already, please make sure to go ahead and give us a like because it helps us out a bunch here at the studio. It's this one. Thanks a lot. Okay, now back to Peter Parker's awful life. Number nine, Man Spider. We've all wished at some point or another that we could have Spider-Man's powers. I mean, the wall crawling alone, I would take. Oh, so useful. But what if you got more than you bargained for power-wise? Well, in Spider-Man Disassembled, we see this in a pretty gross way. Peter starts to become an actual spider, starting with growing an extra set of peepers. Yeah, so that's disgusting. But wait, there's more. He ends up becoming an actual spider, yeah. So after being injected with this goop from the Spider Queen, not only does he grow some extra eyes, but he also gives birth to another Peter Parker. Yeah, you heard me correctly. 
So out comes Peter and he's the same Peter Parker as before, but a little stronger with maybe a hint of PTSD sprinkled in there. But that's not particularly new to Peter. Bonus points to Peter also for attending a wedding with the two extra eyes and not being noticed. Gotta love Star Trek themed weddings. Get away with everything. Number eight, Venom. Making its debut in Amazing Spider-Man 299. Next up on the list, we have the introduction of Venom. Venom is a symbiote from the Clintar race, and after making its way to Earth, it eventually wound up in the hands of, of course, Spider-Man. So this dark symbiote started to make Spider-Man's life better. I mean, he got a cool haircut, started standing up for himself, and the suit made him stronger. It just felt better. But this didn't last too long because the symbiote found its ideal host shortly after Peter ripped it off, and that being Edward Brock. Eddie had visited Our Lady of Saints Church to beg God for forgiveness before ending his own life. And then this alien symbiote bonded with him mentally and physically. Like I said, at this time, Peter was there trying to get rid of the symbiote because it was doing more bad than good in his life. Now, because it had originally bonded with Spider-Man, he basically is another Spider-Man, kind of. He gets the same power Spidey used and also some of the same memories. It's actually why Eddie Brock knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Fun little fact. This ended up creating one of Spider-Man's best villains, and we get to see Tom Hardy reprise the role of Venom in the not so near future. Number seven, Tony Stark's death. With rumors swirling around about the next Spider-Man movie being one within the multiverse, it's only fair to go back and look at some of the sad themes of Spider-Man Far From Home, with of course being the death of Tony Stark. So right off the bat, we see Peter struggling with the weight of the world, having everybody look at him as the new leading Avenger. With most of our other Avengers off-world, Spider-Man facing Mysterio couldn't have been more grueling. This poor kid even gets slammed by a train at one point. It's easy to say this is a time where Peter could for sure go with out. Reconnecting with lost friends, dealing with much older classmates like bad boy Brad, who doesn't make the first year back in school easy for Peter at all. That plus Tony Stark's inventory just being handed off to him, that's a lot of responsibility. The kid's going through a lot of pressure and puberty too. I mean, probably. What a combo. And number six, the affair. Gwen and Norman's affair, to be specific. This is an absolute nightmare of an issue, so of course we're throwing it in here. We go now to Sin's Past, which was this five-part story that revealed that Gwen Stacy had actually had an affair with Norman Osborn. Huh. And they had kids named Gabriel and Sarah. Huh. So he meets them in a pretty wild way. We're introduced to these two twin characters, these new mysterious characters, and one of them really resembles Gwen Stacy, like, by a lot. So Spider-Man 509, this begins, and it starts with a letter from a dead Gwen Stacy. So Peter starts to analyze the situation and the letter and eventually finds out the secret that even Mary Jane knew about. So seven months before Gwen's death, she gave birth to these twins with Norman. But because of Norman's blood, they aged a lot faster. And this wasn't taken too well by comic book fans as this was written out pretty fast. Still an awful time for Peter, I'd say. I mean, even Mary Jane knew about it the whole time. So many secrets, so little time. Number five. Doc Swap. This is a body swapping story that might make you pretty uncomfortable. So we go now to the Amazing Spider-Man 700 where we find a dying Dr. Otto Octavius. So Octavius switches bodies with Spider-Man so that Spider-Man would die in his body and then he would live on inside the body of a superhero and do some good. Not a bad plan. Now the best part of this is that Peter was still inside a little bit. He was able to remain inside the body and could communicate, only communicate, with the new webhead, Otto Octavius. It's like your subconscious just talking to you the whole time. It was pretty neat to see this version of Spider-Man as well. And after a few minutes with the new, younger, healthier body, donned himself the new name, the Superior Spider-Man. And number four, parents are back? Yeah, this one's pretty neat. So right off the cover of this, we see the text, the most cataclysmic events of Spider-Man's life begins in this issue. And that's probably enough to pull you into the issue. I mean, come on. So we find out that Peter's parents have returned from the dead. <sighs> so in the Amazing Spider-Man issue 365, we meet them again. Peter comes home and Aunt May's like, hey, hey, I'm here with our new guests. And Peter's like, oh, new guests, those are always fun. Are those my parents? Yes, Peter's parents had returned from the dead. Well, rather they had never died to begin with. Let me explain. So they went on to explain how they were alive and working for Red School in secret for years. Only it was later revealed that they were evil androids the whole time. So his robo parents were actually collecting some intel about Peter to give back to Chameleon. Chameleon created these fake parents for Green Goblin. 
So many lies. Just a web of lies. Spider-Man web of lies. Now we get it. Number 10, a date with the devil. In New Mutants Volume 3, Issue 30, we find Mephisto taking a pretty strange deal. I mean, compared to his normal read the fine print soul collecting type of deal, that is. This time around, a team of X-Men accidentally enter the home of Mephisto, the underworld, literally hell. So we offered to let them go about their super business and leave hell on one condition. That condition being that he gets a date night with Amara Aquila. So the team encourages her to say no, but she seals the deal. Mephisto says, hey, I'll call you. And then whoosh, they're all gone. Just like that, the team is free. So the team rescued Blink and then Amara prepared for her date. Issue 37, titled A Date with the Devil, we see Magma double checking that she looks good for her date night coming up. Making sure the curls look good, eyeliner's great, we're looking good, let's do it. And just like prom night, her man arrives at the door with flowers. What a gentleman. So they dine, of course, in the third circle of hell, overlooking a lake of lava with volcanoes going off. It's quite the spectacle. I mean, Niagara Falls, hell, you know, both are pretty romantic. And of course they had an amazing pit band to set the mood. She returns back to normal life and admits that she had a pretty decent time once he stopped trying so hard. See, usually when a friend goes on a date, you know, it's exciting to see how it went. Now, imagine if your roommate went on a date with a devil. Oh my God, the amount of tea I would make them spill, we'd never sleep, we'd talk all night. I'd also be worried sick. I'd be like, hey, how was your night? He was the devil, so are you good? Is your soul good? Awesome. As far as forced deals go, this one wasn't too bad but there's plenty, plenty more on this list. And before we get to number nine, guys, if you could go ahead and give this video a thumbs up because it really helps out our studio quite a bit. Thank you so much for watching. Now back to this crazy list. Number nine, closing time. If you've worked at a bar, you know it's the worst when people stay right until the very end, right until closing time. Or even worse, they'll show up minutes before you're about to get out of there. Like three minutes before last call, someone will walk in, grab a drink, and then they'll just chill and unwind the entire night, which is fine, but sometimes you're like, hey man, I've been here for 10 hours, I gotta go now imagine if one of those late night visits was from Mephisto. See, in Journey into Mystery issue 627, we see another hobby of the devils besides taking souls that bartenders will tell stories of. What he would do is show up every night to a random bar or a pub, and then he tells a story. He vents, he lets things off his chest. And if you listen and survive, he'll give you a really nice tip. And I'm talking like a really, really nice tip. You don't have to work anymore at a bar after that point. But if you slip up, things can go pretty south pretty fast. Now this amuses Mephisto. He enjoys playing along and chatting it up with the poor soul who offered to pick up that ship that night. I wonder if I want to see him one night, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Actually, no, let's not see him. Let's, let's not do that. Number eight. What happens in Vegas? Doctor Strange Damnation is a four-parter that puts Mephisto and Doctor Strange in the most epic game of blackjack. Yeah, you thought Casino Royale had like the high stakes? Mm -mm. No devil involved, no way, just Daniel Craig. So following the destruction of Las Vegas after Hydra's short-lived empire, Doctor Strange tried putting the city back to normal using his magic. But in doing so, it resulted in this hotel emerging from the ground and that hotel just happened to be Hotel Inferno. And of course, inside that hotel is Mephisto. Yeah, it turns out when the city went down, Mephisto claimed all of their souls in hell. So in order to come to an agreement to save the city and the people inhabiting it, a game of brimstone blackjack was in order. I mean, being forced on a date is one thing, but a game of blackjack with the devil? I mean, what a, what a better way to start an adventure. Number seven. Master Pandemonium. Martin Preston made his comic book appearance in West Coast Avengers Volume 2, Issue 4. He was a student at Juilliard and a big time Hollywood star. I mean, the guy was killing it. He had money, fame, he was in his 50s, but the guy looked like he was early 40s. Just killing it, just killing the game. Then he thought it would be a cool idea to drink and drive. Not a cool idea, never do that. So of course, after the crash, he was approached by Mephisto and Mephisto had repaired his arm by calling forward a demon. Imagine if Bucky had his arm replaced by a demon. God, it would be a mess. Leaving a five point shaped hole in his chest, Mephisto had lied to Martin and said that it's because he had separated his soul into five different places among Earth's dimension. That was in fact a lie. In actuality, Mephisto had replaced his other limbs with demons as well. So now he's a walking, talking Trojan horse for the devil. Number six, Johnny Blaze. Marvel Spotlight issue five, we see a legend being born the Ghost Rider. See, Johnny Blaze was a stunt performer, and when his stepfather, Crash Simpson, got cancer, Johnny opted to make a deal with Mephisto to save him. And then when Crash tried to return to the stunt life, he crashed. So now Johnny's upset, and he has a few choice words for the devil. So Crash still ended up passing away after all, just not from cancer. Kind of not a great deal. So when Mephisto returned to collect his soul, because he thinks that's a fair deal, Roxanne intervened and used the spell of banishment from one of Johnny's books. Before Mephisto got cast away, he grafted the essence of the demon Zarathos to Johnny's body, thus creating 
the Ghost Rider. Imagine if Roxanne hadn't showed up, he would have just tricked another poor person into trading souls for some lousy deal. Careful what you wish for, folks. Number five, Silver Surfer. When Mephisto first came into Marvel Comics, many thought it was during the events of Ghost Rider, like I just mentioned. He actually tried taking Norrin Rad's soul before in Silver Surfer issue three. The power and the prize. The story begins with the Silver Surfer being tracked down by Mephisto because he's drawn to his power and nobility. What a perfect soul to take, the guy's great. He sees him as an obstacle, of course, because he's the Silver Surfer and he's amazing. So Mephisto captures Norrin Rad's love to use as bait, but the Silver Surfer beat him down. He's one of the few Marvel heroes that actually had defeated Mephisto. So honestly, if the devil ends up showing up in WandaVision at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if the Silver Surfer is next up shortly after. I think we're gonna go more cosmic, especially with Thor 4. Definitely with Thor 4. Number two, assassination attempt. We all talk about when Peter hit Mary Jane in the midst of a fight between him and Ben, but few people seem to recall that Peter also tried to kill Mary Jane during the events of the Clone Saga. So it wasn't necessarily his fault here as he was programmed, brainwashed into doing so by the Jackal, but it still makes for a horrific experience for Mary Jane either way, who at the time was also pregnant with their child. Terrified, she was forced to flee from Peter, running for her life and seeking help from anyone she could find, any of Spider-Man's hopefully super-powered allies. Basically, the Clone Saga was just a really hard time for MJ and pretty much everyone else. It was just a hard time. Number one, baby was taken. One of the worst things to ever happen to MJ was when she was tricked into believing that her and Peter's baby was born stillborn. Mary Jane had a complicated and challenging pregnancy and it was even implied that her baby would be born with powers or develop them over time, possibly even being born a mutant. While out at a restaurant, Alison Mongrain, working for Norman Osborn, slipped something into Mary Jane's food, which resulted in her going into labor. She was then told the baby that she gave birth to was actually stillborn, when in reality, the baby was not dead, but lived and was kidnapped by Mongrain and delivered to Osborne, who paid her to take the baby away. Away to Europe never to be seen or heard from again. It's later suggested the child perished, but there isn't really much explanation as to why Osborne did this, especially so secretly, without MJ and Peter really ever learning of what truly happened till much, much later. It more feels like this was part of an unresolved plot that someone was writing, and the writers just really didn't want the young couple to start a family, so they were like, I guess we'll just leave this, and their baby's gone. The end. <laughs> Wow, some of these are seriously pretty terrible, especially MJ believing that she gave birth to a stillborn baby when she didn't, that's messed up. And this is only some of the traumatizing experiences that MJ has lived through across the multiverse and throughout comic book history. And number three. Gwen Stacy's death. This one left average moviegoers stunned in theaters when The Amazing Spider-Man 2 hit the big screen. We finally see the death of Gwen Stacy and it's beautiful. So of course this comes from the comics, specifically in issue 121 of The Amazing Spider-Man. The Green Goblin ends up dropping her off the Brooklyn Bridge, and although Peter has his trusty webs, sometimes the angle just doesn't quite work out, and Gwen's neck ended up snapping from the momentum. So this happened in the movie as well, and Eagle Eye fans could spot the clock tower in The Amazing Spider-Man 2 striking 1210, which references issue 121. And the way the web shot out like a hand too, I mean, really? Ah, right in the heart. This scene's amazing. I mean, of course it's really sad, but the music, the way it's shot, really drives this part home. I mean, it's sad that this scene was one of the last ones we got from Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man run. Sure, the movies weren't as good as the new installments, but it would have been nice to see where this Spider-Man went after this dark moment. Would have been pretty dark. We'll never know. I mean, maybe, multiverse stuff. We'll see. And number two, identity not so secret. If you stuck around until the very end of Spider-Man Far From Home, you were treated to a pretty sweet teaser. So of course we see J.K. Simmons reprise his role of J. Jonah Jameson in what starts out as a pretty comical scene. Now of course we're happy to see him back in this Spider-Man universe, but he comes bearing bad news. He ends up showing leaked footage from the final battle with Mysterio, and in the footage we see him shout out Spider-Man by his secret identity, Peter Parker, and a nice little photo to go along with it too. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. Back in the comics, before the Civil War storyline, Peter takes a page out of Tony's book and reveals his secret identity to the world. And after that, things go south quite fast, including a hired gun setting his aim on Aunt May. And finally, number one, you guessed it, Uncle Ben's death. Of course, we have to include this in the list and save it for last. We had to sit through this in theaters like numerous times. 
and that's for good reason. One of the biggest moments of Peter Parker's life was when his Uncle Ben died. Now, after letting a thug out of his sights, that thug ended up being the one to take his uncle's life. So not only did Peter, of course, feel saddened by this very close loss, especially not having parents to begin with, but he was responsible for letting this guy get away. He honestly let it happen, and then in Amazing Fantasy issue 15, we see it all unfold. So after a police officer asks Spider-Man why he let the crook get in an elevator and make a break for it, Spider-Man responds with, Sorry pal, that's your job. I'm through being pushed around by anyone. From now on, I just look out for number one. And that means me. And cut to BAM! Number 4. Cynthia Von Doom. The mother of Victor Von Doom. She was known, of course, to dabble in the dark arts. She often communicated with demons and used spells. She was born in Latveria into a Romani clan and her people were constantly facing persecution at the hands of the Baron and his men. So she turned to Mephisto to make a deal, promising her soul in exchange to punish them. So he gave her powers to take care of them, but the only thing was that same power would also take care of the children that were there as well. So he gave her the power, but just not the control. So she couldn't live with herself after what she had done to the children, so she made her husband promise that her son would never follow her footsteps. And then after that, her soul moved to her forever home, which was hell. Number three, using James Mandarin. Doctor Strange Volume 2, Issue 15, titled, Were There Smoke? We see Mephisto use James Mandarin as a pawn against Doctor Strange. It's brutal. So the issue kicks off with Doctor Strange saving a woman from a fire. And when he returns home, he meets up with Clea. But before they can even catch up, a man named James Mandarin comes to the door. But he has a knife in his hand and he claims to know who and what Doctor Strange truly is. But Doctor Strange plays it cool, of course. James does not play it cool. See, he wants to be Strange's disciple. So he slashes at his own throat to make Doctor Strange use his powers and save him. What a power play. Also, you're so insane, but power play indeed. So Strange heals him up, of course, and he proudly puts it together that no normal doctor could have patched him up that fast. And then out pops the devil to make things just that much more exciting. So now the next issue is Strange saving his love from the afterlife. So while Strange waits for the help of Wong to get him out of there, he has to then face off against all sorts of illusions and deceptions unleashed by the devil. They're trying to change him into one of the Hell Lord's minions. So Wanda Maximoff is playing a role in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So I feel like WandaVision will introduce Mephisto and then in his movie, he'll have to go in and finish off the Unholy Terrors with Wanda's help. Number two, Fragments of Greater Darkness. So Avengers West Coast Volume 2 issue 52, we find out the truth behind Scarlet Witch's children, Billy and Tommy. Again, this is another WandaVision theory that I think is happening. Listen up, here we go. So like I said earlier, these five pieces of Pandemonium's soul were actually Mephisto's. So Mephisto tricked Pandemonium and then gathered beings possessing the appropriate fragments. Two of those five fragments just happened to be children of Scarlet Witch and Vision. So when Pandemonium arrived, he took the kids, which in turn gave Mephisto full strength, and then this of course left Scarlet Witch having a breakdown. Again, it's been hinted at that Agnes and Wanda division is actually Agatha Harkness, which would make sense. She's a witch. And then in episode six, we saw everybody in their comic accurate look. And she was of course rocking the witch outfit. Coincidence? I think not. And finally, number one, one more day. We finish off with this four-parter, the One More Day Spider-Man storyline. It began in 2007 in Amazing Spider-Man issue 544, and instead of Pete dealing with the usual thugs or some enhanced science villain with a tail, we see Spider-Man make a deal with the devil. So after Spider-Man revealed his identity in the Civil War storyline, people of course were after him now. So when a bullet strikes Aunt May instead of Peter, he of course feels like he's the one to blame. Absolutely, you took your mask off, that's what happens. Even the opening of the story, it shows Aunt May in a hospital bed with Peter at her side, talking about how she was perfectly fine just a mere days ago. It's very sad. And Mephisto has entered the chat once again. He offers Peter a deal while Aunt May is dying. So basically what happens is that the world will forget about Peter's identity and Aunt May will live. But the whole Mephisto magic is that MJ and Peter never got married. That's just gonna go away. So it's a lose-lose and you're just trying to be a superhero. So they hug one final time and MJ explains that their love was always meant to be and that whatever Mephisto does is unstoppable. And then poof, the deal is sealed. The next day, Peter wakes up all is fine and normal in his casual life. All that backstory was just wiped out in the turn of a page. Thanks to Mephisto, because your deals are just great.